Uh, my name is Alana Hallis, and I'm a new assistant professor at the University of British Columbia. And so I can't match Julia's three FQM schools, but this is my second. Uh, and I have to say the weather, as compared to last year, is a true improvement. Uh, we were dealing with blizzard conditions last time, so this is nice. A little snow. Um, so this is my group at UBC. I work closely with uh, Megan Aronson, and we share uh, lab equipment and we co-supervise postdocs. Um, and this is my student, Graham, who, whoop, there he is. Some of you might know, he's in the audience. And uh, my newest student, Sam, is also in the audience, and he's not in the picture. So obviously, we're going to have to take a new uh, group photo. So my talk today is really focused on uh, the practical aspects of crystal growth. And so hopefully it won't be too dry. I've tried to make the slides basically encyclopedic so that there will be a useful reference for you to go back to. Um, so don't worry so much about digesting everything that's on the slides and writing it down. Uh, it'll be available to you later. Um, and before we get there, ah, there we go. I did want to begin by kind of introducing my group and what we do. So I have an interdisciplinary background. I started out in chemistry and I sort of gradually moved my way towards physics. And so uh, I think that like Julia, I'm applying these sort of chemical principles to the study of quantum materials. And so I'd say that the heart of my research program really is crystal growth. At the moment, I've just arrived at UBC, so I don't have a fully functional lab. So we're focusing on techniques like flux and solid state that don't require any advanced infrastructure. But in the future, we're going to have high pressure uh, synthesis using a multi-anvil apparatus and uh, floating zone image furnace growth. And I think one thing that's kind of uh, strange about my background in crystal growth is that I started with these more advanced techniques like image furnace growth and high pressure and only in my postdoc did I first start doing flux growth which I think is most people's first introduction to crystal growth um, and even though it was the last crystal growth technique that I sampled it ended up being my favorite it has all these advantages that I'm going to talk about and it's really nice it's a great way to get your hands dirty whereas image furnace growth can be quite slow and labor intensive and you really have to know what you want to grow whereas with flux you can just go out and explore so we have the usual sort of suite of characterization tools, PPMS and MPMS, and we also do a fair bit of uh, neutron scattering and muon spin resonance. So the great thing about being at UBC is that we have North America's only MUSR facility right on our campus, so we can just walk down the road to throw our samples into a muon beam. And then uh, the topics that we investigate, I would actually say we're more driven by the materials that we make. So we're going to end up characterizing whatever we make, and it might take us in new directions. So we're not really limited in terms of the topics we study. But historically, I've been most interested in magnets and frustrated magnets. Um, and lately, I've started working on high entropy systems. OK, so start with a little bit of eye candy. Uh, these are crystals that were all grown by the flux technique. And the one thing that I really like to point out, actually, I don't think that's true. I think this is grown by vapor transport. Sorry. <laughs> but the other ones are all grown by flux. Um, so the one thing that I, I really like about flux growth is that when you have a crystal, uh, you can often make a lot of inferences just based on the habit that the crystal takes, its, its architecture. So in the case of this crystal, for example, we can see that it has this nice six-fold symmetry and it's very flat. So this is obviously some sort of two-dimensional material. It turns out to be a transition metal dichalcogenide. And we know, of course, that these flat faces are going to be the 001 directions, and there's two of them. Of course, there's 001 and 001 bar and we know that there are these six equivalent directions along the body and those are of course 110 directions so what's great about this is that if I want to throw this sample into the PPMS or the squid I don't need to do a Lowy measurement to align it I can do it by eye I can look at this crystal and know its orientation and that can save a lot of time so other crystal growth techniques don't necessarily uh, give you this nice access to the habit of the crystal Another example of that is um, materials that grow with this octahedral uh, shape. So those are often cubic materials. This is zirconium zinc 2. And they have eight octahedral faces, and those are the 111 directions. There's eight equivalent 111 directions. So um, that's kind of one of my favorite aspects of flux growth. So here is where we're going. I'm going to give a very brief introduction to flux growth. Um, I know that about two-thirds of you by now have already seen the practical of that in the lab, so um, I'll try to give you the, the bare details. Um, then I'm going to go and do a little bit of an in-depth deep dive on how to read binary phase diagrams, because those are so important to how we come up with our recipes for flux growth. And then I'm going to race as fast as I can to get to these case studies, because I think we can learn probably the most about how to approach flux growth by taking some tricky examples where we encountered problems along the way, and how we actually troubleshooted those problems, and we learned a lot 
lot by doing that. Okay, so this is my lab. <laughs> Uh, it's not too gorgeous yet, although I'm very pleased by the new addition of this turquoise wall, which was something I really had to fight for. Um, so you can see that it, the renovation began in August, and uh, although it is a little difficult to tell, ladders are clearly moving around. Actually, in the most recent picture, I think there's no ladder. Um, it is getting very close to being finished, uh, so we're expecting to take occupancy of our lab around mid-February, which is really exciting. Um, but in the interim, since I've been there in August, how do we do research with a lab that looks like this? The answer is flux growth. Um, we don't need any extensive lab space or any fancy equipment to do flux. As long as we have an electrical outlet where we can plug in our furnace and somewhere that we can do our quartz work, we can do flux growth. And so that's been a really great tool to kind of get us busy in the meantime while our lab looks like this. So these are sort of all of the ingredients that you need to do a flux growth. So you have your consumables, your reagents. So of course you need whatever metals you want to use in your recipe. You need a crucible. And I'm going to talk about how you can choose an appropriate crucible material for your flux growth. And then in general, because we're working with metals and they'll oxidize if we heat them up in air, we have to seal our growth in a quartz tube. And this comes with some natural limitations. So quartz begins to significantly soften around 1200 degrees Celsius. And so if you have any difference in vapor pressure between the outside and the inside of your tube, above 1200, you're usually going to see either your tube is going to collapse in on itself or it's going to explode. So our limit in terms of temperature for flux growth is typically about 1200, although there are some ways that we can get around this that I'll talk about later. In terms of infrastructure, you need a place to do quartz sealing. That's best uh, if you can do it inside of a fume hood. Some people do it on the bench, but that sort of makes me cringe a little bit as a chemist. Um, I would prefer quartz done in a fume hood always. And you have options there as well. So you can use a hydrogen uh, oxygen torch or you can use a methane torch, depending on uh, what you prefer. I think that the hydrogen oxygen torch is preferable. It's hotter, you get a hotter flame, and so it makes the quartz work faster. And then, of course, you need something to heat up your growth, a box furnace, um, and these are pretty inexpensive, so lots of labs will have on the order of 10 to you know, 20 or even 30 box furnaces. So you can do a lot of different flux growths in parallel. And then a nice to have, although not completely necessary item, is a centrifuge retrofitted with some sort of heat resistant material so that you can take your growth out um, at high temperature and separate it from the metal flux. So the total procedure for flux growth looks like this. You have your two crucibles, so this is crucible one, crucible two, and they're separated by a ceramic strainer. So these are the so-called Canfield crucible sets, uh, where instead of uh, putting some quartz wool in between your two crucibles that's going to act as a strainer, you actually have a ceramic that's not going to contaminate your growth. So you've put your metals down at the bottom of one crucible, and you've sealed it inside of a quartz tube. And one thing that you always want to be careful to do is to make sure you have some quartz wool at the top and the bottom end of your growth. Um, these are the weakest points on the tube because that's where you've actually sealed it using the flame. And so Due to the difference in thermal expansion of these two materials, quartz has no thermal expansion essentially, whereas the ceramic has a small amount. If your growth was sitting down here at the bottom of this tube, it's very likely to lead to uh, cracking of the tube. So it's always important to elevate it off the bottom. Then you take your growth and you put it in your furnace, you heat it up so that you have a uniform and homogeneous uh, metallic liquid, so you've melted all of your metals. And then you're going to apply some temperature gradient. You're going to decrease the temperature. And hopefully what's going to happen is that crystals are going to precipitate out of the melt. And they'll be sitting in some larger solution. So usually we have an excess of one of the metals. And that's our solvent. So this is exactly analogous to growing sugar crystals out of a uh, water solution, which you might have done as an experiment. Uh, except instead of water and sugar, all of your ingredients are metals. So at some uh, temperature, you're going to decide to stop this process, and we'll dis discuss a little bit later in the talk how you come up with that temperature. And that's where you're going to want to do the separation. So if you have one of these nice centrifuges, you can put your growth into uh, one of the holders, spin your growth by turning it upside down, and your crystals will be trapped by the strainer, which has very small holes, but it's large enough to allow the liquid melt to flow through it, keeping the solvent and the crystals separated. Okay, so the first thing that you usually need to decide is what makes a good flux. The best case scenario is if what you want to grow 
has in it one of these elements that works as a flux, because then you can use what's known as a self-flux. So that means that the flux is also an ingredient in the crystal. Um, sometimes you have to consider a third metal or a fourth metal as a flux if it doesn't have anything that's appropriate to act as a flux. Um, but that's somewhat of a less desirable situation, because you're more likely to get that phase, that, meta that metal, as an inclusion. So in general, our properties of good fluxes are that they should have a low melting temperature. They're obviously our solvent, so we need everything else to melt into them. Uh, so we want them to melt at a relatively low temperature. Another really important thing for conventional metal flux is that you want to have a large separation between the melting temperature and the boiling temperature, because this is going to basically tell you about the vapor pressure of your melt. Um, so materials that have vapor, or sorry, materials that have melting temperatures and boiling temperatures that are quite close together will have very high vapor pressures uh, in their liquid phase, and that can lead to uh, your tube exploding, basically. Uh, so in general, we're looking for things that will have a big separation. And then finally, sorry, uh, you want to make sure that whatever your flux is, that it's not going to have a chemical reaction with the container or that the vapor isn't going to attack the quartz. Um, and you also want to make sure that it's not going to form any unwanted binary side products. So this list on the right hand side is basically the core group of fluxes. These are sort of the, the standards, the hits. Um, they all have little caveats. Uh, for example, aluminum, if you're using aluminum as your flux, you can't do your reaction sealed in quartz because the vapor is very um, corrosive towards uh, quartz tubes, so it will attack the quartz and uh, it will not be able to sustain the reaction. Lead and tin are both great fluxes, but they have the downside that if you do have a small amount of tin or lead trapped in your material, they're superconductors. Um, and so you're going to see that in your electrical transport measurements. Actually, the same thing goes for aluminum. Um, tin and lead, though, are a little bit worse in terms of their propensity to coat uh, liquids, or sorry, coat crystals, so they're more difficult to completely remove. They stay on the surface of the crystal and are prone to inclusions. Gallium, as well, uh, is, uh, is quite nasty for staying on the surface of crystals. And then I've also included a few other uh, less common fluxes that you'll see in the literature. So cerium is actually a good uh, flux for growing many phases with antimonides. Um, but when you have very large concentrations of cerium, you can't carry out your growth in alumina, so you have to consider alternate crucibles. Zinc is quite tricky because there's this small gap between its melting temperature and its boiling temperature, although there are very clever ways to get around this, and I've provided references at the end of the talk that you can see for this. Uh, and Julia has done a ton of work with uh, antinomy, antinomy, antimony as a flux. Um, Actually, I don't see any reason why it's not one of the more commonly used fluxes. Its melting temperature is a bit high, but in general, I, I don't know of any reason why it's a more challenging flux than anything else. And this is by no means uh, um, the entire story. There are other metals that can be used as fluxes, and uh, the way that you decide what flux to use is you always want to consult your binary phase diagrams, which we'll get to in a bit. Okay, so if you've picked a flux, the next thing you need to do is pick a container. There are sort of these guidelines that you can find in the literature, depending on what metals you're using, uh, what fluxes, or sorry, what containers are recommended. Again, you always want to go back and look at the binary phase diagrams. So for example, if I were interested in growing tin, and I was thinking, I don't know, do I want to use a platinum crucible? I'm going to go check out the tin platinum phase diagram. And if it turns out that platinum is very soluble in tin, that's not going to be a great flux. I really don't want to melt my platinum crucible. Um, the other consideration is, of course, if you have multiple options, then you're going to prioritize cost. I would say alumina is the choice for all cases where um, it works. It's cheap. There's those nice Canfield kits that have the built-in strainer. It's easy to work with. Uh, tantalum is a little bit more expensive, and as we'll discuss later, it's a little bit more time intensive in terms of actually preparing your growth. Graphite is also quite cheap, and platinum is, of course, one of the most expensive crucible materials. Okay, so just to summarize, wrap up on the introduction to flux, I wanted to break down the pros and the cons of this method. Um, so the big picture pro of flux growth in my books is that it's extremely well suited to exploratory synthesis. Um, 
And these are all reasons why that's true. So the first is that it's relatively inexpensive. It doesn't require any large scale infrastructure. You can put together a growth using relatively little reagents. Even if your metals that you're working with are quite expensive, you can get away with using less than half a gram for just a sample growth. The next is the speed. You can easily conduct a single flux growth in one to two days. The prep time to prepare a growth when you're experienced can be on the order of 20 to 30 minutes per growth. So in a day, you can easily put together eight to 10 growths if you have sufficient furnace space. You can put multiple growths into one furnace if they share a similar temperature profile. If you're really going after a specific phase, you can explore a wide range of compositions and see what works. The next is quality. Um, this isn't always true. Flux doesn't always give the best crystals for the type that you're growing, but it often gives very high quality crystals. So this here is an example of a paper from Paul Canfield's group where they made a material platinum tin four, and it has triple R's that range between 750 and just over 1,000. So these are exceptionally high quality crystals. The ratio of your room temperature resistivity and your low temperature resistivity approaching, say, zero Kelvin is taken as sort of a, a, an indicator of how many scattering centers and impurities are in your material. And so a high ratio indicates a high crystalline quality. And this is very good. And then the kind of best thing of all is that in flux growth, when you fail, you sometimes succeed. So you always usually have something kind of in mind that you're going after, but a lot of times you don't get what you expect to find, and that's when you discover a new material. And even as Julia said, if it's not a completely new material, it's known in the literature, its properties may not be known. And since you already have it, you accidentally made it, you may as well do a little bit of exploratory characterization work, a quick you know, magnetization measurement or a really quick resistivity measurement just to see what you've got. And I think a lot of really interesting materials are discovered that way. OK, there are cons, of course. Uh, it's not all rosy. So the crystals are not the largest. They're also not the smallest. But typical flux-grown crystals are sub-centimeter. Um, and so in some cases, if you need a lot of material for some, sensitive, for some technique that's volume sensitive, like neutron scattering, uh, you end up being constrained to make many crystals and co-align them. So this is an example of uh, 14 co-aligned crystals of yttrium cobalt 2. And this was a, a crystal that I prepared for a collaborator. And the largest crystal we were able to grow was on the order of 200 to 300 milligrams. And that's that one centered right here. Uh, but we had to use, this was the work of about 15 different batches and it's all sealed in tantalum so it's incredibly time intensive and in the end we ended up with about 2.5 grams of material uh, for this neutron scattering experiment. The next is that in most cases you're limited to 1200. There are ways to get around this uh, but for most things that's where you're going to be kind of stuck at. It gets a little bit more tricky to go above 1200. You're limited to things that chemically will work. Uh, so there's certain elements and certain combinations of elements that are kind of a no-go. Um, and so not everything is going to work. But that's, of course, true of every technique. Vapor pressure. So we usually can't work with high concentrations of any element that has a very high vapor pressure, or else you end up with things that look like this. So this is a tantalum tube that has exploded out on itself. It's hard to see in this picture, but that furnace inside is ruined. It is just coated in material. There's a cracked quartz tube in there. And this is a quartz tube which has clearly had a high vapor pressure, but seems to have maintained its seal. So it's puffed up on itself, but uh, it actually hasn't exploded. So moderate success. And then, of course, if you're using, uh, for any flux, actually, you always have the po possibility of getting um, either the flux itself or some binary as an unwanted impurity phase, which could even be an inclusion in your crystal. OK, on to part two. Good. OK, so now we're going to do kind of a deep dive. And it's going to be really quick. And there's lots of terminology, but we'll try to get through it as quickly as possible on binary phase diagrams. So this is kind of one of the simplest binary phase diagrams one can envision. On this left-hand side, we have element A. On this right-hand side, we have element B. And you can actually see what I've stolen. It's bismuth and cadmium. So this is a real phase diagram. I've just relabeled everything to be generic. So this line here represents the case where we have 100% bismuth. And this line here represents the case where we have 100% cadmium. And then everything in between is uh, a mixture of the two adding up to 100%. So for example, right here, I have 30% of B 
and 70% of A. So what's going on in these different regions? Up here, the dark region, this is my homogeneous liquid. That's where everything is melted. And because it's melted, it's very quick for the different metal atoms to diffuse around one another, and the liquid is basically homogeneous. These two regions here are regions where we have two phases coexisting. We have some of solid B here and a liquid, and on this side we have some of solid A and a liquid. And so since we have some of solid A, compared to the initial composition, it means that our liquid must be slightly rich in B relative to the ratio that we started with. And then the opposite is true here. For a composition at this point, if I have some of solid B, the liquid must have a little bit less of B in it than what I started with. So the liquid is slightly richer in A. Down here is the phase where everything is solid. So in this binary phase diagram, there's no ordered compounds between bismuth and cadmium, which would be represented by a vertical line. And so we have two distinct solid phases. They don't actually form any ordered compounds. Okay, so that's a boring phase diagram. This is a slightly more interesting phase diagram. And the same sort of logic applies to how we understand what's going on in the different regions. The liquid is up here. Here, everything is liquid. And you can see, depending on the composition, the temperature at which everything becomes liquid varies quite significantly. So I think this is, does that say 1300, 1350 for this composition? Whereas we have a melting temperature as low as 675 down here. All of these square regions are where everything is solid, and everything that has a curved line has some mixture of compositions between a solid and a liquid. So that's sort of my way of thinking of it. Um, I've never actually seen that written down in the literature, but it's, it's self-apparently true that anytime you have a curved line, you have a mixture of liquid and solid, and anytime you have an area enclosed by a box, it's all solid. Okay, so everything on here has uh, a name. So the line that separates the phase that's all liquid from one that has liquid and solid is known as the liquidus. These horizontal lines that separate the liquid solid from the all solid region is known as the solidus. These positions here where you can see there's a local minima in the melting temperature. So it comes down here to a minimum and it intersects with the solidus and it also comes down on this side and intersects with the solidus. This is known as a eutectic and eutectic points can be incredibly useful. So sometimes in rare cases you might even grow a material using a eutectic mixture of two other elements um, just to get everything into a lower melting configuration. So this point in fact is lower than the melting temperature of either pure ytterbium or even pure, ooh, it's actually about the same as the pure aluminum. This one is lower than both. It's slightly lower than the pure aluminum melting temperature, and it's significantly lower than the pure ytterbium. Then there's another type of point known as a peritectic point, and this is a point where a compound spontaneously decomposes into a solid of a different composition and a liquid. So here, this is the line representing ytterbium aluminum 3, and at this point, that solid decomposes into ytterbium aluminum 2 and a liquid. So then we have two types of compounds that we can grow. On this phase diagram, there are two ordered compounds represented by the vertical lines, ytterbium aluminum 3 and ytterbium aluminum 2. And the thing that you can notice right away that's different between them is that the line for ytterbium aluminum 2 goes all the way up to the liquidus. And this tells us that this compound is congruently melting. Um, it never decomposes into something else. It goes directly from its solid face into a liquid melt that is homogeneous. To contrast, ytterbium aluminum 3 is what we know as an incongruently melting compound, so it paratactically decomposes at some temperature. And when we approach the growth of these incongruent or congruently melting compounds, there's slightly different strategies we have to take. Okay, so here is an even more complicated phase diagram. These things can get incredibly complicated. So some binary phase diagrams will have upwards of 10 ordered compounds, and it gets to be quite overwhelming. Um, so one thing that I want to point out is that you could imagine growing a compound like this, which is congruently melting, simply by heating up that exact ratio of the elements. So in this case, it's 75 to 25 of neodymium and cobalt, and then just cooling it down uh, directly. And that's what's known as an online growth. The problem with that is because that is the exact melting temperature of your compound, it's going to nucleate in a lot of places all at once. And you may get very uncontrolled nucleations. And in a lot of cases, this is going to lead to small or lower quality crystals. Um, this isn't always true. There are some materials that grow very nicely from online melts, but for 
a lot of others, it's, it's true that they don't grow nicely from that. And so actually, um, we want to grow this material, neodymium-3 cobalt, by uh, going off composition and using its exposed liquidus to access the phase. And I'll describe how we do that a little bit later. But so naively, what I really want to point out here is that this material seems like it should be easier to grow nice crystals, but in fact, this incongruently melting compound here, neodymium cobalt-2, is actually way easier to grow. The reason it's easier to grow is that it has this huge exposed liquidus. So this liquidus line is associated with this phase. That's the phase it connects to. So if I cool down a composition here, I precipitate out neodymium cobalt too, and my liquid becomes progressively neodymium rich. And because I have this huge exposed liquidus, I can quite easily grow this phase. Whereas over here, my exposed liquidus has a much narrower composition range and temperature range, and so I'm not going to be able to precipitate out as much of that crystal. Um, and so I might try the online melt, but it might lead to lower crystal quality. Okay. And then the word of wisdom, which I'm sure you've heard a hundred times by now, is that these binary phase diagrams are really useful, and you should definitely consult them and use them as a starting point, but they can be wrong. Um, this summer, my student Graham and I worked on a growth which is a simple binary, and so it should be just the easiest thing in the world. We should be able to look at that phase diagram and grow that material. And lo and behold, growth after growth after growth, we're still working on it actually, uh, has not succeeded. And so we know that binary phase diagram is incorrect. Um, so these are empirical. So sometimes things are extrapolated from known data and that means they can be uh, incorrect. Okay, so last but not least, uh, I call this the good, the bad, and the ugly. So binary phase diagrams come in all shapes and sizes. A good one to me looks like this, where there's a number of compounds and all of those compounds have large exposed liquidus. I can grow everything on this binary phase diagram, no problem. This is a bad binary phase diagram in my opinion. It has no compounds, it's not interesting to me. And this is ugly. These are two materials that are completely immiscible. They have zero solubility between each other, um, so I can't even melt them. So that's really ugly. Um, and then finally, where do you get these binary phase diagrams? So there's a number of places. Um, actually, kind of my favorite is books. Um, you can get these handbooks, uh, and they have all of these phase diagrams in them, and you can flip through them. Um, if you're lucky, your university will have a database access. And there's two types of binary phase diagrams you might be interested in. One is for intermetallics, in which case you want this alloy database. But if it's ceramics or oxides that you're interested in, then this is the database you want to look at. And uh, this is actually a resource that my student Graham found, which is an online repository of um, a great deal of phase diagrams. And what's interesting there is that they have different versions that have been updated through the years. So you can actually consult six or seven different phase diagrams for any one composition and see what's, what's consistent between them so it seems more accurate and what's different. It gives you an idea of where the uncertainty is. Okay, now on to actual materials. So I'm going to take you through four case studies um, and they're going to kind of progress in terms of the complexity of uh, the material that we're going to try to grow and they're all going to have different problems that we encounter. So we have a binary incongruently melting compound, a binary congruently melting compound, a ternary, and then a quaternary. Okay. So the first compound that I'm going to introduce you to is yttrium cobalt-2. The reason we became interested in this material was actually through a collaboration. So our collaborators at Ames Lab were interested in performing neutron scattering on this material because it is a material that's very close to a magnetic instability. So it's non-magnetic, it doesn't have any magnetic order, but at very high magnetic fields we observe a paramagnetic to ferromagnetic transition. Um, and so the question is what does the spin dynamics of a system like that look like. And in general, when you're doing inelastic neutron scattering, you can do it on a powder, but you get a lot more information when you're working with a crystal. So we looked through the literature, and it turned out that, to the best of our knowledge, nobody had ever grown this material as a single crystal. And initially, this was sort of surprising to us because the phase diagram doesn't look that bad. Um, it's pretty workable. But maybe someone tried and they encountered the problems we encountered. So our starting point, our guess about how to approach the growth of this material is that we want to use this nice exposed liquidus over here. And so we picked a starting composition marked by this yellow dot, 43% of yttrium, 57% of cobalt. And so what should happen is that as we cool this mixture down, we're going to continue to precipitate out yttrium cobalt too. 
and our mixture is going to become more yttrium rich. So our, our, our liquid is going to follow this line here. And then we want to spin our growth, take it out of the furnace, and separate the liquid from the crystals at this second point here. Because if we cool any lower, we're actually going to begin to uh, crystallize out another phase that we're not interested in, this yttrium 2 cobalt 3 phase. So we want to make sure we stop before we begin to get that second phase. So that seems simple. Um, that's something that we should be able to do. The temperatures are all within our range. 1200 is our cutoff for using quartz. Everything should work. But of course, I wouldn't be showing it to you if it was that simple. So challenge number one, uh, this mixture here, it should melt if it was perfectly homogeneous. But the problem is that cobalt has a melting temperature that's much higher. So does yttrium, up above 1500. And so for big chunks of yttrium and cobalt, which we are forced to work with, because yttrium and cobalt are both incredibly hard. So cutting it up into tiny, tiny pieces, not fun, not possible. So our mixture here, it's not going to melt at 1200. Our big chunks of cobalt are not going to melt. Our big chunks of yttrium are not going to melt. Nothing is going to dissolve anything. No possibilities to create a melt. Challenge two is that at 57, or sorry, 43% yttrium, that's a pretty high concentration of a rare earth. And what we observed is that it interacts quite badly with the crucible. We didn't actually diagnose what was going on, but we could see that the crucible material was being attacked. And we also observed that the quartz itself um, was being damaged by the vapor of the yttrium. And so we can't work with our favorite alumina crucibles. But we did come up with solutions to these problems. So solution one, this is a great technique whenever you have something that has a melting temperature that's getting close to 1200, is that you can pre-arc melt your reagents and that creates a homogeneous mixture. And as soon as I have something homogeneous, it's gonna melt. Now I have a mixture that really is locally this composition and it's gonna melt at 1200. So I give it a little bit of extra time to make sure it's nice and melted. But once it's arc melted, it will melt. Uh, and this is something that we troubleshooted, um, of course, our first attempts at this growth. The way we figured this out is that we threw the metals into a growth and they didn't melt. Then we arc melted it, tried to melt it, it succeeded. Challenge two, the uh, high concentrations of yttria. This we can overcome by using a tantalum tube instead of a alumina crucible. So. Uh, Tantalum is quite uh, great for high concentrations of a rare earth. The problem though is that using a tantalum tube adds three additional, or sorry, the tantalum adds two additional arc melting steps. This arc melting step adds a third additional arc melting step. So what's really happened here is that we've turned a 30 minute growth prep into about half a day of work uh, to do all this arc melting. And so this is just an example of how something that seems really simple can become really complicated, but in the end it did work and we got these beautiful uh, quasi-octahedral crystals and some beautiful neutron scattering data. Yeah? So why you didn't use the stoichiometry? The what? Why you didn't use the 33% of uh, ethereum and cobalt is 66%? Oh, so this material is incongruently melting. So if I use this mixture here, I'll go back to where you can see it fully. So if I used a mixture here and I cool down, I'm going to precipitate out yttrium cobalt 3. This liquidus is not connected to the yttrium cobalt 2 phase. It's always connected to what's uh, its vertical line. But so if we slowly cool it, cool it down, then it should come back to the uh, same Nope. If I cool this down, it's going to crystallize out yttrium cobalt 3, and my liquid's going to go over here. The next thing I'll crystallize out, in fact, is... Uh, then I can crystallize it out, but I'm going to have a mixture of phases at that point. And then I need to be able to visually identify which crystal is which. Yeah, so whenever possible, you don't want to have deliberately a mixture of phases, because you also don't know if those two crystals are going to intergrow with one another or form inclusions. Um, it just creates this entire element of um, complexity that's just not necessary. Another question is, uh, why did you choose only this ethereum 43 and uh, ethereum 43 and 57 ratio? As opposed to, I, I think we could have choose some other things on the liquid line. Oh yeah, so I want to start up at the closest point to um, the melting point of this compound. So I want to have the largest interval of liquidus as I cool down. If I start over here, say, instead, which has a higher concentration of yttrium, then I have less exposed liquidus, my crystals are going to be smaller. The amount of liquidus that I cool over is proportional to the amount of material I precipitate out. 
And I didn't go closer to the left because then it gets a little bit dangerous. You don't know exactly how resolved uh, that point on the phase diagram is. So if I move a little to the left, I'm at risk of crystallizing out yttrium cobalt 3. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So, yeah. These uh, tantalum growths can be quite powerful. The problem is that you do need to have an arc melter to effectively use a, a tantalum method. So um, there's two really great references that you can look at from previous uh, FQM schools to learn a little bit more about this tantalum method. The first is the talks of Ryan Bombach, who spoke at last year's meeting, and then also talks by Paul Canfield, which I believe is from two meetings ago, uh, where they talk about this. And there's also a review article by Paul Canfield where he discusses this uh, method. Um, um, that I linked to at the end of the talk. So you sort of have two options for how you can approach tantalum growths. You can either use the packet method, which is shown here, where basically you take a sheet of tantalum and you fold it up and then you use an arc melter to seal one of the ends. So you have to seal one of the ends in advance, add your material, and then seal the other end. And since the arc melter is under, say, an argon environment, it means that there's no air trapped inside your growth. And then you seal your tantalum inside of a quartz tube. You have to do that because the tantalum by itself, if you just threw it in the furnace, is going to oxidize and expose everything that's inside of your growth. So unfortunately, even though you have the enclosed environment of the tantalum, you still have to add the extra step of the quartz sealing. The disadvantage of using the packet method is um, it has no strainer, and so you can't spin growths that have a packet in them, which means you have to find some other way to separate your crystals from the flux. Whereas with this tube method, which is much more labor intensive, um, you do actually create a tantalum strainer that you can put inside of your tantalum tube, and you use the arc melter to, to solder the caps onto both ends of the tube. Um, and so it's kind of equivalent to the Canfield sets of alumina, except built out of a single piece of tantalum. And of course, it's completely fused once you're finished. This is a single piece of tantalum. And so to take your growth apart at the end, you actually have to use a, a pipe cutter to break open the tantalum. And so this method, it's not reusable. You can't reuse these uh, tantalum tubes once you've built them. Um, it is actually possible to buy pre-made tantalum crucibles from various manufacturers, but they're really, really expensive. And you're still stuck with this problem of getting the end cap on. So it is much cheaper just to go the second additional step and do both caps yourself. It adds time, but it saves a lot of money. Okay. Can you uh, just say, roughly speaking, how much what cost is involved? Yeah, so these... I currently don't have an arc melter because my lab is under construction, so we don't have the necessary uh, uh, power to support our generator for our arc melter. So we've looked into this actually, of buying the pre-made uh, tantalum tubes. And we got estimates anywhere between $200 a tube to about $300 a tube. So that's, for something, if you're not sure it's gonna work, that's too much in my view. Whereas we kind of priced it out based on the raw materials to make tubes like this, which uh, I've done in the Morishan lab at Rice. We were using, um, um, tantalum tubes and tantalum sheets to create the caps on the end. And we priced it out at about 15 to 20 dollars per growth, which is getting to the point where it's quite, you know, doable. Um, now, that cost doesn't include the student's time who's actually doing the work, so depending on how you value your own time, that number begins to go up. <laughs> okay. Our second example is an, uh, a congruently melting material, samarium hexaboride. And I have to admit, uh, before last year's FQM meeting, I didn't know all that much about samarium hexaboride, but last year the concluding um, workshop at the end of the meeting was focused on this material. And one of the things we heard about all day, again and again and again, was this issue of sample quality. So there's two types of uh, crystals of samarium hexaboride. There are the flux crystals, and there are the floating zone crystals. And they both have issues, and the question really is, which issue is preferable in terms of studying the physical property. Okay, so first things first, here's our phase diagram for samarium and boron, um, and here's samarium hexaboride. So in contrast to yttrium cobalt 2, this line extends all the way up to the liquidus. We have a congruently melting compound, but dun dun, its melting temperature is 2500 degrees Celsius, uh, so that's pretty problematic. And even the lowest exposed liquidus that we have is down here at about, what, 2100? Um, so this is not a material that we can grow using our conventional um, 
binary mixture in a alumina tube in a quartz tube. Simply can't reach these temperatures. So the reason that this material uh, is of interest dates back to I think the late 60s, early 70s. Um, so the first studies of these materials revealed that samarium has an interbe intermediate valence, so it's not strictly a samarium 2 plus or samarium 3 plus, and it also has very interesting transport properties. You would naively expect this material to be a metal, but its electrical resistivity is very decidedly insulating. Um, and so more recently, um, people have or termed this type of behavior as a condo insulator, where that insulating behavior derives from the samarium valence. Okay. So it's not a congruently melting compound, um, and its exposed liquidus is above 2100 degrees Celsius. The solution that we're going to use for this problem is to find a third metal that can act as a flux for samarium and boron. Boron is an incredibly difficult material to dissolve in anything. It has very low solubility in just about everything, but the best option turns out to be aluminum. So here we have the aluminum boron phase diagram. Now we have two phase diagrams we need to consider. So we got rid of the samarium boron phase diagram, but now we need to look at each of those metals with respect to our third flux, which is aluminum. So we see that below 1200, we have limited solubility of boron in aluminum, but we have decently good uh, solubility of samarium in aluminum. So just to kind of uh, orient you, this is again, 100% boron, 100% samarium. This is 100% aluminum. So sorry, actually, we should be looking over here. This is the limit where we have a small amount of samarium and uh, mostly aluminum. Okay. So what do we do? Um, the problem is that our boron, even though it is slightly soluble in aluminum, it still has quite a limited solubility. We can't dissolve very much of it in the aluminum. And so the way that we overcome that is by actually going to slightly higher temperatures than 1200, because the solubility does increase as we get to slightly higher temperatures. If we can push this growth to about 1400 degrees, we can get quite a lot more boron dissolved into that aluminum mixture. But if we go to 1400, we can no longer um, use our quartz tube. So Let's go through all of the ways we're going to approach this. One, limited solubility. We're going to scale way up. Instead of using uh, our typical kind of one to two grams for flux growth, I don't know exactly what this is, but I'm ballparking it at something like 30 grams. This is a tremendous amount of material for a flux growth. And so that's going to be proportional to the amount of yield uh, you get out of the growth. So this is a ratio of one to six to 600 parts aluminum. Next, we can't go to 1200, we have to go above 1200, so we can't use quartz tubes. Um, so this is where we're going to take a different approach to how we actually um, set up the growth. Instead of just using a box furnace, we can use a vertical, or sorry, a horizontal tube furnace like this and flow an inert gas through it, like argon, or you can use a vacuum furnace. And so um, in that case, then we don't need to seal our growth. We can simply put it into the alumina crucible, leave it exposed, and it won't reach any air because the, the furnace itself is under either vacuum or an inert environment. Next, because we're not using a quartz tube, we can't spin it. If I have an open crucible, I can't turn it upside down into my centrifuge or else I'm going to just pour liquid everywhere all over the lab. Um, and I don't think the UBC safety officers would be very happy if I poured 25 grams of molten aluminum onto the floor. So we're going to have to find a different way to get rid of the flux so that we can isolate our crystals. In this case, the solution was to use a sodium hydroxide solution, which dissolves the alumina, but leaves the crystals kind of untouched. Next problem, we get a little bit of aluminum in the crystals. This is actually a really big problem. <laughs> um, so. This is a beautiful crystal that was uh, grown by uh, Priscilla Rose, and it has um, you know, very beautiful transport. So what they've done with this material is look for quantum oscillations. So a very interesting question in samarium hexaboride is does it have a Fermi surface, or does it have quantum oscillations that indicate some sort of pseudo-Fermi surface? And at first, the answer seemed to be yes. People were seeing quantum oscillations in these crystals of samarium hexaboride. But it, turns out is actually happening is that they're not intrinsic to the samarium hexaboride phase. Those quantum oscillations actually come from very, very microscopic quantities of aluminum that are trapped in our samarium hexaboride crystals. So they did some very nice work in this paper where they showed that as they progressively thinned the crystal down, they eventually reached a point where there was no more aluminum and boom, 
the quantum oscillations disappear. And so there isn't actually a robust solution yet to this problem except to um, kind of trial and error it. And it's very difficult to diagnose these very small quantities of um, aluminum. They wouldn't show up, for example, in an x-ray at the level that they're in the crystal. Um, and so doing an experiment to look for quantum oscillations out to 50 tesla to tell you if you have aluminum is not exactly a cost-effective way to diagnose your crystalline quality. And then finally, um, as I mentioned before, you can grow crystals of samarium hexaboride by floating zone, but they have a completely different problem, which is that due to the difference in melting temperature between samarium and boron, by the time you've melted all that boron, you've boiled off a bunch of samarium. And so now you don't have a, a stoichiometric ratio of samarium and boron, and your crystals have uh, pretty high concentrations of samarium vacancies, which I think from the perspective of the community is a worse problem, because it, then you're tampering with the intrinsic problem properties of the samarium hexaboride phase, whereas the aluminum inclusion just adds something extra that you don't want. Yeah. Okay. Third, uh, this is an example that I won't spend very much time on because we heard a lot about these 3, 4, 13 phases from, from Julia. Um, but the example that I'm going to tell you about here is cerium-3, iridium-4, germanium-13. The way that we became interested in this phase is that uh, a previous student in the Morishan lab had grown ytterbium-3, iridium-4, germanium-13, and it had some very interesting properties. It was a semi-metal with um, condo-like behavior and low carrier uh, concentrations. And so, pretty simply, if you grow something with ytterbium, you often just want to try growing it with cerium to see what it does. Cerium and ytterbium have this kind of parallel behavior. Um, cerium in its 3 plus oxidation state or 3 plus valence has a 4F1 electron configuration and it has an instability towards forming a cerium 4 plus valence which has a, a 4F0 configuration. Ytterbium on the other hand has 4F13 so it has one unfilled F electron orbital. Um, and it has an instability towards an ytterbium 2 plus valence, which is completely filled. So the parallel that you see here is that the 4F13 and 4F1 configurations are magnetic, whereas 4F0 and 4F14, completely empty and completely filled, are non-magnetic. And so this valence instability is really at the heart of this interesting condo physics and heavy fermion behavior. And in general, if you make any phase with one rare earth, there's a pretty safe bet that it forms with a lot of other rare earths, uh, maybe even the whole range. So I would say uh, a good thing to aim for if you're working in this area of rare earth physics is to discover any new material with a rare earth and your PhD is set from that point on because you can probably grow it with the whole series of rare earths and they're all gonna have different physical properties because um, rare earth physics is really sensitive to the filling of those 4F orbitals. You get very different anisotropies and interactions. So it's a great way to make a PhD. That's how I did mine. <laughs> so now we have three elements. We have cerium, iridium, germanium. None of them were on that list that I told you of good fluxes, actually. Um, so none of these have a pretty low melting temperature. In fact, iridium has an incredibly high melting temperature. Um, and so there isn't much reason to be that optimistic that we could reasonably grow this material by self-flux. And adding kind of insult to injury, when we look at the different binary phase diagrams, we see that we don't have one for germanium and iridium. So actually, I should introduce, this is an example of a ternary phase diagram, which we're sort of composing for ourselves from these binary phase diagrams. So to read a phase diagram like this, I can pick any given point and I can read off the composition uh, by looking at these parallel lines. So here, I connect this line here, which extends out. This is 0.6, and this is 0.6 of cerium. So this corner here is 100% cerium, this corner here is 100% germanium, and this corner here is 100% iridium. So going back to this point, this is 0.6 cerium, 0.2 of germanium, and 0.2 of iridium. And uh, you can get quite messed up looking at these things. They kind of make your eyes cross after a while. But just make sure when you look at any composition that it actually does add up to 100% uh, is a good rule of thumb. And so we can infer a little bit by looking at the binary phase diagrams. So here we have germanium, or sorry, cerium iridium, and here we have germanium cerium, and we're missing germanium uh, iridium. And the composition that we're interested in growing is marked by the red star. So that's the 3, 4, 13 phase. And right away, this looks horrible for us. There are so many ternary phases on this phase diagram that are already known, and in particular, 
there are two that are really, really close to the 3, 4, 13 composition. So whatever, if this phase even exists, it has an incredibly narrow window of formation uh, because we know that these two phases are obviously easier to make because somebody already made them. So the first thing we tried, uh, yeah, this is kind of a graphical representation of these three phases here. So obviously it adds up to 100, and the length of the bar represents how much of it is in the phase. So comparing the 113, the 3413, and the 137 phase, you can see that especially these two, very similar. Um, so it's going to be very difficult to make that third phase that we're interested in, the 3413. So we knew off the bat that if 3413 exists, it's not congruently melting because we tried to arc melt the three elements in a stoichiometric ratio, and we observed none of the 3413 phase, even if we anneal it, which would uh, bring it out if it was not kinetically stable. It doesn't exist in the arc melted mixture. So we know that this phase, if it has a window of formation, it's really small and it's incongruent. So the first thing we tried is a composition over here represented by uh, the blue circle. And what we got out of that were crystals of the 113 phase. The next thing we tried was a circle over here, which is closer towards the red circle, or red star. And we got out of that the 137 phase. And what I should mention here is the reason we're working in this corner is, first of all, over here, that's an iridium-rich corner. Iridium is a worse flux than germanium. It has a very high melting temperature. We're never going to be able to melt anything over here. And cerium-rich can work, but it's, it's tricky, and there's a lot of phases in between where we're trying to get to and, uh, and where we're starting. We're more likely to form a phase like this. So we kind of want to be over here because it's uh, the directest path to the phase we're interested in. So luckily, this composition here, marked by the blue circle, does lead to the 3413 phase, and we get beautiful crystals that look like this. So the faces on those crystals are um, just barely larger than a millimeter. Uh, and this was, in fact, because I had spent my entire PhD working on insulators, this was the first material I ever attempted to, by hand, attach leads on um, for electrical resistivity measurements. So it was really trial by fire for me, and I learned that I actually love putting resistivity leads on. It's kind of like meditation or something. <laughs> In the future, you can probably just buy a machine that can do it with you know, more precision than a student doing it by hand, but I did it by hand. Um, well, so there are these wire bonders, right? People use wire bonders to put yeah. leads on with limited success. <laughs> yeah, it's faster for a student to do it, um, even if it's a really, really tiny crystal like this. So uh, the thing that I want to highlight is I just showed you three compositions on the graph that we tried, and the range in those compositions was tiny first of all. So there wasn't a lot of difference between our starting composition and the one that ended up working. And that doesn't actually tell you the full story. In addition to composition, there's all of these other parameters we can play with, including the maximum temperature that we go to, the spinning temperature, the crucible material, so on and so forth. And so growing those tiny millimeter-sized crystals was really a labor of love. It took about 30 attempts uh, to grow those crystals. Um, but in the end, we did have them. And this is just an example of sort of the uh, power of collaboration. So this is a powder refinement based on the single crystal work that Julia Chan did. So she solved the crystal structure of this material for us using single crystal x-ray. Um, and you can see that as compared to the cubic model, um, this reduced symmetry tetragonal model actually captures all of these tiny reflections. And this is like a grievance, but... I'll just say it. We had a referee say to us that it was not clear that the tetragonal model was better than the cubic model, which I still can't get over. I'm just I'm perplexed by that, but there you have it. So this is the crystal structure where now we have these three inequivalent cerium sites. And the importance of that for our paper was um, it turns out that in this structure we have a true mixed valence material. Two of our cerium sites are cerium 3 plus, and the third is a cerium 4 plus, which is non-magnetic. And so in our property measurements, we only see, for example, uh, an effective moment and susceptibility or, or an entropy release that is equivalent to two-thirds of the cerium being magnetic. And this completely perplexed us for months until we understood from Julia that we had this reduced symmetry and um, that only two-thirds of our cerium are magnetic.
And we can, in fact, correlate that with the structure because cerium-4 plus and cerium-3 plus have different sizes. And so the cerium-4 plus environment is actually larger um, due to, you know, as you go across the lanthanide series, you have a contraction. So cerium-4 plus is larger than cerium-3 plus. Okay. The last example is actually not really an example, it's just a story. I'll be very quick. Um, so I just recently started working at uh, UBC and a story that I kind of knew but didn't know all that well was the story of uh, yttrium barium copper oxide, this kind of uh, pinnacle of high temperature superconductivity, um, which I knew had been grown at, at UBC but I didn't really know the full extent of what had gone on there. And I think it's a story that isn't maybe as well known as it should be. So this is of course a very important high temperature superconductor. And a group of scientists at UBC led by Ruxing Liang, who was a professional material scientist, worked on the growth of this material for well over 20 years, dating back to, you know, almost the very beginning of the discovery of high TC up until about 2012. So they published this review article a, a few years ago, probably about seven or eight years ago now where they detail all of the different ways they discovered how to improve the material. And you can read those here. I won't go through them step by step, but I mean, it's, it's extensive. You can see that it's years and years of research that went into perfecting the growth of just one material. They worked on one material for 20 years, so that's really uh, a labor of commitment. And one thing that I think is quite cute um, is that to actually separate the flux of this material from uh, the crystals from the liquid, they used a method where they perched the crucible on top of a roller and they have a pin that pokes into the, into, the, into the furnace and they poke that pin through, knocking the crucible over and the, the solvent flows down here where the crystals are trapped up here. And so uh, I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> okay, so here are some beautiful crystals of YBCO. One of the parts that was really important to, to actually growing this material was the uh, crucible choice. So you could grow YBCO crystals in any number of crucibles, but they have various problems that are sort of enumerated here. Um, and so one of the innovations that they made was to actually develop their own crucible material, which is barium zirconate. It's not a commercially available crucible. At least it wasn't back then. Maybe it is now. Um, and so they actually developed within UBC, a facility to produce these barium zirconate crucibles, these massive presses, and they were growing very high quantities of barium zirconate. And one thing that I think is quite amazing is that these large-scale growths with more than 30 grams of reagents produce only 0.2 grams of YBCO crystals. And so these were the best YBCO crystals in the world. Um, they'd gone to, you know, dozens and dozens of collaborators around the world. They produced um, about 200 papers. A pretty high fraction of those are in nature and science. And this is, um, so I looked for the combination of Ruxing Liang, Doug Bon, and Walter Hardy. They appear on all of these papers because they worked on it together. And so if you do a Google Scholar on the three, you can pretty safely guess that that's a YBCO paper. And this is a, a citation report for those papers. So the drop here is because 2020 just started. But you can see it's an enormous number of citations. <laughs> um, and uh, very recently, there was a list of the most influential scientists of the last decades, just judging by um, the frequency by which these people appear on high impact papers. And uh, in Canada, the only physicists who appeared on that list, the list was enormous, it included thousands of names, but the only physicists in all of Canada who appeared on the list were those three. And it's clearly related to these 200 papers, 16,000 plus citations. So, that's sort of meant to be, I don't know if it's demoralizing or moralize, or um, inspiring that you can work on something for 20 years, but clearly you can have a, a really huge impact. And I've been inspired by that since I came to UBC. Okay, and uh, there's nothing to say here. These are just some of the papers uh, that I find to be the most useful. Um, I only focused really on intermetallic growth today, although at the very end you got a touch of oxides, and that's a whole different world of flux growth. Um, and so if that's something that appeals to you, these are two good starting points. And I would also refer you to this uh, relatively recent book by my friend Makoto Tachibana, which is a beginner's guide to flux growth. It's really readable, it's like 100 pages. Um, yeah, highly recommend it. So that's, that's it. Thank you very much.